A companion of the Prophet وسلم, by the name of Salman Al Farsi describes his journey to meeting Rasulullah. The essence of his journey is that the world was full of darkness and there was no beacon of light that remained for him to attach to until one of his teachers told him that in Medina would be where the final Prophet would arrive. So he arrived in Medina Munawwara through a very gruesome and difficult journey until he was able to set his eyes on the Prophet. The story of the companions of the Prophet who were trying to make sense out of a very complicated, difficult world. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed them with the honor of crossing paths with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Seeing him, being with him, learning from him, transformed and changed their lives. The story of Islam is one of the importance of revelation. That throughout history, you see where revelation found its place in the hearts of people and communities, they became leaders. And where revelation left people, only so long you can continue to push forward before you realize that you are untethered and this small canoe that you're in stands no chance against the waves of the ocean. They will surely swallow you. The Prophet ﷺ is in Ghar Hira, distancing himself from the people of Mecca. And while he's in that moment, just reflecting and connecting with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Sayyidina Jibreel ﷺ shows up. And one of the greatest moments to possibly occur in the existence of this earth occurred. The crown of prophethood was granted one last time to a human being and not to any human being, to the best of all, Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. An era that was referred to as the period of ignorance was about to leap forward, not slowly and gradually, but a big jump was about to occur. The best of generations was about to come into existence. And in this moment when Jibreel alayhi salam approaches Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam and he offers him this revelation, the beginning of the Quran starts with telling the Ummah and the Prophet of Allah and mankind till the end of times, Iqra bismi rabbika alladhi khalaq. We are a nation, we are a people that takes pride in knowing that education and learning is at the center of our deen. Anytime something sways away from that education, from that knowledge, it puts itself at great risk. We are sitting in a big pool of all sorts of ideas. Confusion is everywhere. I think one of the biggest challenges that we have in today's world and something that fears me to my core is truth no longer exists. Everything is based off of subjective ideas that what I view to be true is this and what you view to be true is that. The Quran tells us what our realities are. Times will change, people will change, the weather will change, the world will change. But these realities are unshakable. Allahu haqqun, wal naru haqqun, wal jannatu haqqun, wal siratu haqqun, wal mizanu haqqun. That these things are realities. That your jannah is a reality, your fire of hell is a reality, you standing in front of Allah is a reality. This is not a dream, this is not something made up. Today you're trying to figure out what to do in this path that you're walking on, but remember the destination is certain and that is your grave. Either you will leave first or someone will beat you to it. Either you're carrying someone or someone is carrying you. The question is, what did you do on this path while you have the opportunity to walk on it? The Quran prepares us for that. It tells us of people who came before to warn us of people who messed up and those who did great. All the people who did amazing in the Quran, the summary of their story is they were tested by Allah and they stood firm and strong that they got confused and there was wealth thrown at them and family was thrown at them and problems came at them. But the men and women who now stand in the hall of fame of the Quran are people who did not waver and stood strong like pillars. Whether it was in the battlefield, they were remembered or if they were traveling with the Prophet wasallam, they were remembered. Because the people who allow their hearts to connect to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are worth being remembered. Then the second part of the Quran tells us about what comes ahead. And what comes ahead is the day of judgment, where every human being is accountable for what they do in this present right now. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, لا يغادر صغيرة ولا كبيرة إلا أحصاها. So every day in my life when I wake up and I'm going through my routine, and I go to work and I'm at school and I'm driving and I'm picking up the kids and dropping them off, I have to constantly make decisions. And each of those things that I do and each decision that I make has an impact in this moment right now. But as a Muslim, I believe there is a greater impact. We all believe that there is a greater impact that we will see in the hereafter. The true value of a decision isn't only based off of what it gives you today. In reality, it's based off of what it gives you in your eternal life. What happens when you stand in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Sometimes it's just the smallest moments in this world where a person becomes vulnerable and sincere. Least expected moments 
and they're maybe in front of Allah on the day of judgment and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala pardons them for that moment. It's as if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is waiting for us to give him one moment of our life, undistracted, pure love, that I'm willing to do something, Ya Allah, for you. You created me for you. Let me at least give you a moment of my life where it's only about you. The hadith in Bukhari is very well known regarding the lady who gave water to the dog. She had lived an immoral life, but in that moment she did something sincere where it wasn't about her. It wasn't about what people would see. It was about what she was doing right there, right then for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ibn Abdul Bar narrates this incident that once Abu Dawud al Sidistani was on a ship and he was traveling and they were passing by a shore and there was a person on the shore who sneezed. And he said, Alhamdulillah. Now as Muslims we know when someone sneezes and says Alhamdulillah, it is a responsibility for you to reply by saying, Yarhamukallah. He was an old man and didn't have the ability to say it loud enough for that person to hear him. So he said to the person on the ship that I would like to rent one of these small boats to go to that island. And he went to the island and he went to that person and said, Yarhamukallah and came back to his ship. His companions say in that moment we heard a voice from the unseen saying, Ishtara Abu Dawood al Jannata bi ashara dirah that Abu Dawood just purchased his Jannah for 10 dirham. It's a bushra, it's a glad tiding. And it's a lesson for us all that every day we have opportunities to earn our Jannah, moments of sincerity. Some of us, we believe that our opportunity to shine as Muslims is while we're in the masjid, which is amazing. But you have to realize that what kind of Islam and Iman you have in your heart shines when you walk out of the walls of the masjid. Who you are in your life. Whether you have found peace with yourself and your Iman to be one, or whether they will continue to be divided and exist in parallel lives. That in the masjid you are one person, in front of the Quran you are one person, in Mecca and Medina you are one person, but when you go back to your family, a very different human being. How does this Islam reach a person's heart? Well, it comes through interacting with revelation. Iqra bismi Reading itself and gathering information isn't enough for your salvation because you must know that there are people who have walked on this earth before us who had a massive amount of knowledge yet they were misguided. Because information is not the same as knowledge. As Muslims, we view knowledge to be transformative, that it brings change in you, that it is little but meaningful. It allows you to be a better person. Your family members see you smile. Your child notices compassion. Wife feels love. Father and mother feel respect. People at work notice that you are a kinder person because every time you interact with your deen and you learn, you transform to be a better person. The world we live in today has become a frenzy of just gathering information that go online and listen to a snippet here and read a tweet there and gather a little post from social media here. And we assume that all these things together bring change. In order for knowledge, which is a raw ingredient to bring change in you, it must be paired with a meaningful process. The first part of this process is specifically when you interact with revelation that you will need to humble yourself. Therefore, the verse reads, Iqra bismi rabbika alladhi khalaq. Teaching us to be humble because you are reading revelation that was sent by the one who created you. Khalaq al-insana min alaq. Iqra wa rabbuka al-akram alladhi allama bil qalam and allama al-insana ma lam ya'lam. He taught you what you do not know. When a person sits in front of revelation with arrogance and they've made their mind up, and no matter how much of the Quran or Hadith you quote to them, they are unwilling to budge because in their minds, they are gods, they are the revealers, they are the prophets, and they are the ones that will implement revelation. There is a big problem waiting ahead for them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also tells us of such people in the Quran. Read the stories of Fir'aun and Qarun who found it very difficult to bow down in front of revelation. The Quran is calling us to wake up from this zombie-like state of constant perpetual stagnation where we can't see beyond what our physical eyes lock onto. And the Quran is telling us to learn to look with our hearts and our mind. So Rasulullah wasallam's life, let's take a page from there. He walks through the world and for everything he has a dhikr that accompanies it, telling us that in that moment, whether he's climbing a mountain, descending in the market, entering his home, exiting, traveling, eating, relieving himself, that before and after all of these things, he is interacting with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's able to see the world with his heart and with his eyes because there are some people their realities are comparable to that of a parrot that what you throw at it, it regurgitates it right back at you, right? The parrot isn't able to intellectually engage with the content that it has. There's no deeper dimension to what it says. But on the other hand, you have bees that take filth and turn it into the most sweet thing that the human being can taste. This is where the engagement of the heart comes into the place. And this is what the Quran is calling us towards, towards a place of tafakkur and tadabbur that you are reflecting, you're thinking. What's the purpose of my life? 
What am I doing here? How did I end up in this land? How do I have all this wealth? What am I doing with this intellect? Was all of this for me to just build my personal mini mansion and empire so that when I stand in front of Allah on the Day of Judgment, Allah says to me, Yaqub, tell me what did you do with your life? And you say, Ya Allah, I nailed it. 4,000 square foot home, four car garage, Mercedes in each one. Imagine the disappointment in that moment that I gave you a heart with the ability to love Allah more valuable than anything the world can offer. And you came back with these silly Lego-like toys. Did you not understand what this heart was actually for? That every time when you do such that in front of Allah, there is an opportunity there for you to earn your Jannah. Every time you stand in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and say Allahu Akbar, you are saying something that has the weight to shake the earth and the heavens. Only if you connect your mind and heart to that word that you're saying, change will occur. So people ask, why is it that my salah doesn't bring change in me? Well, it's because you're not allowing it to enter into your heart. The world that we live in, our egos push us to believe that we are gods in our world unquestionable and accountable. We do what we want and no one can push me to do anything. Salah is a reminder that that's not true. You are accountable and you are a servant. You have a responsibility of obedience and that is to your Allah. And therefore we start our Salah every day by saying Allahu Akbar, admitting to this truth that I belong to Allah. And then the journey starts, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen that I belong to Allah, as does everything in this world. A Rahman and Rahim, but not a relationship that's built off of oppression because people think of the relationship of a master and servant to be an oppressive one. A Rahman and Rahim, my master is different. Maliki yawm al-deen, iyaka na'budu wa iyaka nistan. Ya Allah, I've just come from a messy life and I'm about to go back to one after I say my salam. So my plea to you is, ihdina as-salat al-mustaqim. Guide this heart. Take it by its forelock, against its own will. Push away shaitan. Grant me dominance over my nafs. Allow this heart to love you and beat in your obedience. Every heart of the believer desires to love Allah. And that's why you'll see that when someone talks about loving Allah, tears swell into our eyes. This is no coincidence. The reason why we become so still when someone talks about loving Allah is because the fitrah, that soul that lies at the center of your existence begins to wake up and it yearns to fulfill the purpose it was created for. And that's for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A heart will always want Allah and it will always desire Allah, no matter how much you're distracted. Umm al-Mu'minin Aisha radiallahu anha asked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa a beautiful question. She said, O Messenger of Allah, why do you pray? So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam responds back by saying, Afala akuna abdan shakura, gratitude. I'm thankful to Allah. So when I take out time from my day and I go to the side of my store and I pray salah, or when I pull over at the airport and I pray my salah, or I step aside from the table when food is being served at a restaurant and I pray my salah, or I'm at home and I pull over to the corner or come to the masjid to pray salah, in that moment, I'm just saying to Allah, thank you. Thank you for everything. I'm grateful that you gave me the ability to be the person that I am, a work in progress. But more than anything, I'm grateful that you blessed this heart with iman. Because there are people who will live and die in this earth and they won't have one moment of love with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They won't get a chance to even say Allah's name with love once. And here you and I are with the freedom, opportunity, ability to worship Allah as much as we want, to love Him whenever we want. What's your relationship with Allah? This can change with a change in perspective. You can choose to have Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's presence with you for the rest of your life if you're willing to commit to be in His remembrance. That's where change comes. By constantly thinking and being reflective over the favors of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not being in denial and rejection. Understanding that we live in a world that is hyper-materialistic and a cloak of distractions have been casted over us. So we are lost within our TVs, within our series and shows and our video games, our vacations and our trips. Those things have a place in our life where you just need to relax sometimes and unplug from the busy life. But that's not why we were created. The reason why you and I were created was to worship Allah and to build a meaningful relationship with Him. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us tawfiq. May He guide us, give light in these dark paths in this world that we live in. 